fine. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So, how are how many how many interviews have you done already? Um. I mean, this is this is only my second one. I did the first one with uh with Jonah. I've never done an interview before that. Um. That one worked out pretty well. I watched it. Yeah, I'm I'm happy with the way that it turned out. I mean, it, it, first one. it helps. It helps that I I know both of you guys well. So, with him, I had like a a structure of questions that I wanted to ask, and I can just do the same thing with you. Just again, because like we've known yeah. each other for a long time. But I don't know. I think I was just kind of scared to do that because I don't really have like. The, did you ever watch the on point interviews that like Spencer did with people? Daria's husband. Do you remember those? Oh, I think he grabbed me for one once and it was terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> only because I had just like lost and I was running around. Yeah. But, um, it was kind of like in the venue, right? All of them? Yes, exactly. Or, yeah. He did it. He was doing a good job. I yeah. just don't remember because I was not in a place to remember. <laughs> Yeah, he, like I was kind of, I was kind of thinking I don't really want to do interviews because I don't think I could do them that well. Um, but it's it's different when you're talking to your friends. So I've done yeah. the one with Jonah. You'll be my second interview. I've done two Q and A's now. One with um, three of the foil coaches and one with three saber coaches, and that one I should be releasing pretty soon. Um, that could be interesting. Yeah. Is it about Olympic stuff or just say, general? Say again. Is it about all the Olympics craziness or just? No, general? this uh, we 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 talked about it a little bit towards the end, um, and I just wanted to get their take on like what's going on with their clubs and like the coronavirus and stuff. But um, in general, it was just I like I put out one of those question stickers on Instagram. I was like, if you could ask one of the top coaches in the country anything, what would you ask them? Oh, and yeah, I think I saw that. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, that's cool. Yeah. Going through a lot of work. That's good. Yeah. Like we were saying before, um, I mean, I have this opportunity now, and I could either complain and drive myself crazy, or I could just try to, like... Making use of the time. Yeah. yeah. And when I when I want to do something, it's like, it's like an itch, almost. I have to just go do it. Like, this morning, I was... I, I have trouble sleeping sometimes, so I got up... I, I woke up this morning at, like, 4, and I was, like, 4.30, and I was trying to go back to sleep... I know it was not good. And then after like an hour, I, it just wasn't working. And I was like thinking about this idea that I had. I was like, you know what? I've got to go do it. So I just went downstairs and got my computer and just got to work. And that was the video that I released today. Other people just get on Netflix at that point and just kind yeah. of try to fall asleep. I know. No, so you're more proactive, which is good. I'm trying. <sighs> okay. I think a big problem with all of this uh, quarantining stuff and us losing our normal schedules is we spend too much time resting mm -hmm. and then we can't sleep properly that could and be it lose track of all the structure that we have in our lives and it's really unhealthy so it's it's important to stay busy oh, yeah it, it's almost like it, it's not just that the day of the week doesn't matter it's it's almost like the time of the day doesn't matter mm, none of it matters yeah, yeah exactly because you you have nowhere to be and in except for stuff like this i'm not like I'm not on any kind of schedule. So yeah. I was like, that was one of the things I was thinking. I was like lying awake at like five in the morning and it was like, why am I even trying to go back to sleep? Why don't I just get up and just do something? That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, mean, I, have to, I have to make sure I study and I have to make sure I pretend to do some exercises as much as I can. Yeah. And then wake up and go to sleep at the same time, no matter what, and be super disciplined about it. Cause I've slept a little bit this past week. Yeah. And it's awful for my sleep. So the schedule is super important. Yeah. It's still so true. How are you staying in shape and stuff right now? I'm doing as much as I can as far as like going outside and running. Um, I'm not great with running because running is the worst thing I ever. Know. Yeah, it's awful. But, but in the absence of I, anything else. I find like staircases and run up and down them because uh, I feel... Um, for me, at least, it feels like I fence a lot better when I do a lot of stairs. Uh, oh, really? Like the intensity, the intensity, the muscle pick off, and then keeping going when you're really tired is very similar to a saber belt. Yeah, I've noticed, or my type of fencing. And it makes more sense anyway. Like you, running a long distance won't really help you too much no. unless your goal is to like, I don't know, unless your goal is to like <laughs> fence ten bouts or something. But 
Yeah, yeah, it's not bad for sure. Yeah. But I think long distance running is more applicable to Epe, whereas sprints or running stair set is more applicable to Saber. Yeah, totally. Yeah, have you met Pumpkin? Oh my god, that's a perfect name for that cat. <laughs> he's very fluffy. Hello, Pumpkin. And he's trying to ask me what I'm doing. Yeah, they're always asking. He's possessive of my time. But that's super cute. <laughs> I noticed when I was gone, because I haven't been able to go to World Cups, it's been a lot more time with Pumpkin, and it's so much nice to just sit at home with Pumpkin. I don't know. Silver lining. I'm, I'm sure he loves it, too. Yeah, that's what it's all about, right? Finding the silver lining. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> okay. So, I sent you the questions that I had. We've, yeah. <laughs> we basically already started talking about some stuff, but... um. Do you want to talk about like how you got into fencing and why you chose Saber and just like your origin story? It was a little bit random because I was 10 years old. Uh, so my family was, uh, my dad, my mom and dad homeschooled us. Okay. Uh, I have three siblings, so four kids being homeschooled was a little chaotic. Three siblings? Um, two, two of them fenced? Two, three siblings. Two of them fenced, one didn't. Okay. My older sister did ballet, and she was really good at it. Um, and the rest of us, at least I, was terrible at ballet. <laughs> it was really pathetically funny. <laughs> so I'm like, please, 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 can we find a different sport? Um, uh, something that we can do as homeschoolers was a must because mm -hmm. we didn't have a team, you know, a school team. Uh, so my dad. Uh, and mom kind of were looking around. My mom found a flyer in like a pizza parlor for a fencing class downtown Chicago. And we were like, oh, this looks good. Uh, we had just watched Star Wars, like the original series too. So we were super into it, I think at the time. Yeah, of course. Uh, What's more appealing yeah, for little kids than hitting each other with swords? Yeah, exactly. And we were, uh, my older sister was a little bit older, but then me and my brother... And then, you know, my brother and I were 13 months apart, so we were definitely beating each other up all the time. <laughs> Robert's um, older? I'm older than my brother, so okay. somehow that managed to keep us, like, at the same physical level until we were, like, 14, 15. So we were always beating each other up. Um, so fencing was going to be a healthier outlet. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then my little sister, Gracie, also liked it. So, But at the time, we were, like, 10, 9, and 7. So yeah, it was a little I've, bit random, a little bit lucky. I fenced your brother a couple times. I, um, yeah. <laughs> we fenced each other in the top eight of junior Olympics one time, actually. Um, Is that the, like the time he won, he got a medal in junior Olympics, like in 2008, something like that. No, it was a little bit after that. I think it was my, it was my last year. My, I think it was 2009. Okay, then you, you definitely won then. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he was very annoying defense. He is a counterattack king. Me too. <laughs> yes, I know. I was watching some of your stuff. Uh, yeah. And uh, Saber specifically, how did you get into that? Or that was just what? the club that you went to? Sorry, what was the beginning of the question? Oh, yeah. Why did you decide on Saber specifically? Or that's just the club that you went to? Oh, no. My club actually had all three weapons. Um, we were... Basically, the head coach just talked to all of us. Mm -hmm. My brother and little sister were put into Saber immediately. She was like, I don't know what to do with you, Liza. <laughs> You're a little bit weird. So she started me off in foil. Uh, and was terrible at it. Went over to Epe. I actually really liked Epe. I was going to stay in Epe. Yeah. But then my dad was like, you know what? Your siblings are in Saber, and I'm not buying two different kinds of equipment. So we and, went over to Saber. And you not have no choice. Better. Not just that. Um, it's it's like you have to go on a completely different night of the week, and yeah, yeah, it was just going to be a nightmare. So yeah. consolidate. So we're good at with homeschooling. Yeah, I know these. Th there are these three kids on one of the Long Island high school teams who are like competitive, but in like a really bad way. They like, they like cause real problems on the team. So the coach like separated one of them in each weapon. And the mom was like, it's awful. I have to go to practice like every single night and I'm just bringing one kid on each of those nights. Oh my God. Yeah. That's not fun. No. To be fair, we 
we did get fairly heated in our bouts, like especially my brother and I. Oh, I'm sure. We did not make fun on the referee. However, we got better after a long time. Yeah, but and it was definitely good at pushing us to get better. Yeah, the we were, competition, I like, I yeah. mean, I always tell people who are like struggling with their motivation, like, find a rival. Just yes. I mean, for, yeah. for this, this sounds kind of mean, but for me, my like, my. I, I just need someone to hate. And like, if you, yeah. if you have someone who you like hate to lose to, or just like, you just don't like who's better than you. I mean, that can push you like, I don't want to lose this person. And so like, I, I should spend an extra five minutes on this dummy because of this one person. Yeah. It doesn't have to be necessarily someone you hate for me. It just <laughs> has to be someone you respect. will never look up to because you are inherently competitors. Yeah. Uh, but you're going to try your best to beat them. Do you have a Just person, the do you have a person in your crosshairs f for that right now? I mean, uh, it's changed over the years. Of so course it has. obviously it was my brother when we were little. Yeah. <laughs> and then anyone who was kind of the best person in the room. Yeah. In practice. And you try to keep it civil. <laughs> you don't always, you don't always succeed. Yes. Uh, try not to take it off the strip with you, but just work your hardest in the bout. Uh, yeah, I think it really depends on where I'm practicing, when it is. Yeah, taking it off the strip, not taking it off the strip with you is so important. I used to not be able to do that very well. I mean, that's everybody. You yeah. just learn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's just kind of, yeah, you just need to just realize that like the two things are very separate. And yeah. for me, it used to be hard like fencing my friends for the same reason, but you need to get over both of those things. Yeah, when I was growing up, I had a really hard time taking it, you know, beating them because it's like you're, they're your friends. You yeah. shouldn't beat your friends. You're nice. You're, you support each other. Yeah. But then you have to learn, no. It's a competition. What happens on the strip is strictly on the strip. You do your best, and that's what you should expect from your opponent. And you know, are done with the bout, and that's it. You're back to being friends. Yeah. Well. So I don't think we met each other until maybe college right did you yeah. did you have um did you have success like when you were younger or did it start did you start doing well in your age group later um i mean i was always you know knocking on the door um it was kind of like me Dominika Francescavich, Allison Miller from the Midwest. We were always ending up defensing like Becca Ward, that age group. Oh, yeah. So we were always kind of in the top that's, eight, that's top tough. four of every competition, but yeah. Becca would always beat me. Right. Except once or something out of like 20. But man, and Carolyn Beloka. Yeah, that's a hard group, man. Uh, Eileen Hassett. Uh, it, was a, it was a good group. Uh, I think it, because it was a tough group, we pushed each other more. And this was, so I was never, this was when Kiki Atropolsky was your, your coach? Uh, are you still? Yeah. 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 It's funny, you know, by that nickname. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I worked with, uh, his identical twin brother, Vasil yeah. and, uh, Kiki's nephew. And there was like, yeah. I remember there was one tournament I was at where, Vasil couldn't make it and Mike who was my coach at the time was fencing and so I was hooking up and Kiki just like walked past and he's like like where's your coach I was like he's fencing right nice. now and and he's like well do you want me to coach you I was like yes please <laughs> you pretend it's the same person <laughs> yeah so we have like the Bulgarian connection um how was it was it similar That's yeah it good. was similar the the two of them I mean speaking of like sibling rivalries for for those oh, yeah. of, for those of you who don't know, um, Vasil Etropolsky, oh, yeah. um was world champion, and Kiki was um, he he got second place two years later. They were both world number one. Um, yeah, like I don't know, they they like pioneered the way that the Bulgarians fence right now. Yes, they were incredibly athletic and incredibly smart. Yeah. You could not outthink them in the strip. Right, exactly. Even when, like, normally when you're fencing old people, you can just, like, be more physical and 
move better than them but like with the two of them they just they're yeah. so smart it's like they were just outsmart you every single time yeah um it was really good being their student because or Christo's student because he would teach you that from the beginning don't rely on the coach you have to think for yourself yes exactly Take responsibility for your own fencing if you lose it's because you did not think hard enough yes it's yeah, from the beginning and it, it's so important i i like i think fencing is really interesting because there are so many people i know who are really smart people but they're not smart fencers and yeah. then i have a conversation with them about this stuff and they're just like so clueless i'm like i don't i don't get it like you're you're a smart <laughs> person i can tell from interacting with you why does this not like make sense to you and i think right. part of it is like the coaches are are so like almost overly involved that the the people never learn to do it themselves yes yes um, there are one or two examples where that works well. I'm not going to call people out, but <laughs> I've seen it and it's perfect. Um, but it has to be one of the two extremes. Either you don't think at all and you trust your coach 100% or you think 99% and your coach, you know, helps with the last 1%. Yeah, totally. You could... One or the other extreme. Yeah. Or it and won't work. the problem with, um, the extreme that you, that we were just talking about where like the coach does all the thinking it's like, well, what if your coach isn't there? What if your coach isn't there? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a big problem, especially at the clubs where they have like fifteen kids in one event and only like two or three coaches. Like yep. that, that's not a sustainable strategy. Nope. That's I don't know. why we were always pushed to think for ourselves. Really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank goodness. Yeah, and if that feels like um, it, it I don't know. It, it feels like very much a Bulgarian thing, like all the. The Bulgarian coaches I know very much like push that. Force you to take responsibility for your fencing. Yes. Yeah. Um, do not compliment you ever unless you have <laughs> really, really done a good job. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but those compliments are well earned. Yes. Um, as often. Did you did did going to Princeton have anything to do with uh, Hristo uh, Hristo Hristov being there? Um. I think a little bit. Um, so Hristo Atopolsky and Hristo Hristov knew each other from the Bulgarian national team. Yeah. I think Hristo was you know, a little bit older and so transitioned into being a coach for their national team mm -hmm. at one point. So he was coaching Hristo Atopolsky. So they were definitely very close friends, knew each other well. Um, yeah. And because I was high enough in the national rankings to kind of be on the radar, mm -hmm. I guess, for college recruitment, um, Christo Christoph called up Christo Trafalski and he was like, hey, <laughs> what do you think? But, uh, how about you talk to Stone for me? See what the interest is there. Um, so neither of them pushed me. They just told me that, you know, they were interested. Mm -hmm. Very, very informal. Um, and then basically I had to sit down with my parents. And my parents always put a emphasis on education first you know athletics fits into education not education fits into athletics so right. we wanted to find a good school uh, and then because princeton obviously is a good school and has fencing it seems like a, a check good, and check a good a good perfect place for me to go yeah uh, if it worked out obviously if i got lucky enough to get in and they recruited me and i had a little bit of help that way yeah but hey no, I mean, so, so much of it is about, like, who you know and setting yourself apart. So. Yes, yes. Um, in order to get into any good school, you need some something that sets you apart. Yeah, totally. Whether it's winning Chinese math competition or uh, being recruited for fencing. Yeah. You can just get in with, it, you know, with perfect scores. You have to have something else. Right, and a sport is almost like, it's like, it double helps you because... One, it looks good and it, it like it's more interesting and two, the coach is yeah. helping you too. So Yeah, yeah. All that is good. Uh, yeah, sport is definitely the way to go if you if you can manage to use it to get into a good school. Yeah. So did you start doing World Cups while you were at Princeton or afterwards? I started my senior year of college. Okay. Which uh is super late compared to other people who on average who do senior World Cups. Did you do junior um, World Cups and cadets and stuff? I did one cadet World Cup when I was kind of in the 
you know, on the radar for Princeton and I had to kind of show that I was a good oh. fencer. So I went to Montreal for an undesignated cadet world cup and I won it. Nice. It was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty small. <laughs> um, I think I actually had to fence Monogoc Summit for the gold and it was 15, 14 or something. It was real close. Damn. Um, uh, but that was my only international experience, I think, until senior year of college. Wow. I said it was not super, I did not think I would want to be this serious about fencing until that point. I went to Princeton and I was like, okay, I'm going to fence NCAA fencing. It's going to be really hard, take up most of my time. Um, and I'm going to be happy with that. Yeah. Uh, focus on my studies. And then I was going to have to face retiring from fencing. I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready for that. <laughs> now what's next? What, what, what can I do to continue? Yeah, and I had a fair amount of success senior year of college in, in NCAA fencing, and that gave me a little bit of confidence to see if I had it, uh, see if I had what it took to go for World Cups, take nice. the jump. What was your um? Where was your first World Cup? Orléans, I think. Really, France. That's a strong it's really competition. The same countries that we still go to, but yeah. I think it was Orlando. Yeah, back in uh, like back in the day when we were do like when we started doing World Cups, there were a lot more of them. For people who don't know, I think there were like thirteen in one season, or something. Uh, you started before I did. Oh really? Um, yeah. Yeah, there were. Okay, so when I started, there were like thirteen in one season, and so not every country went to everything, yeah. but. A country in like Central Europe like that was always a very well attended always tournament. Always and always popular. Yeah. 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 No, I started uh, 2012 to 2013 season, and okay. at that point, it was just just the designated ones, kind of like how it is now. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I was also there for your first medal in uh, in Moscow in 2014. Yes. Uh, so that was a year after I started the natural fencing, I had a steep mountain to climb, Yeah, but it was, yeah, but you climbed uh, it. I made a medal, two medals that year. It was a good year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You medaled there and in Senegal, Senegal. Right. I did not yeah. go to that one. Two, two bronze medals. It seems like when I get to the floor, I check out. <laughs> well, that's a mental game. Yeah, it's mental situation. It's tough to be so mentally focused for so long. It's a long day. And then you're like, Oh, I've succeeded. I'm in the four. This is an amazing day. And then you somehow lose your fire. Yeah, that's and no, you stay, stay super focused. Right, exactly. Not, not be happy with what you've got. Yes, that's a dangerous thing to think. Yes. And you can fall into that easily. Yeah. Any tips for people on how to like on how to improve their focus or any, any, like any tips on like improving your mentality or staying focused, anything like that? Uh, so I've gone through some rather up and down segments in my career. Everybody has. Uh, I've hit really well and really badly and I had to figure out why. Uh, there was a lot going on injury wise, etc. but I definitely lost confidence mm -hmm. and you have to build back up your confidence first. Um, confidence is 99% of it at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. When you're at a world cup, pretty much everybody is a really good fencer. Yes. Everybody knows how to parry. Everybody knows how to attack. Yes. And it's the one who's going to have more confidence to take the risk, uh, more confidence to trust your instincts. That's that one, that person's going to win. Um, another thing, don't rely on anybody else to win the bout for you. Mm -hmm. Your coach, your friends, whatever. You have to go out there and do your own work. Yeah. You have the confidence to do it and do the work every single day to have the confidence when the time comes. Yeah, exactly. And part of building the confidence for tournaments is just doing it in practice. Because yes. if you can execute yes. it well in practice, there's no reason like there's no reason that you you shouldn't feel like you can do it the same way in a tournament, right? Yes. Um, 
Uh, part of it is a sort of meditation that you can do in the middle of competition and in the middle of practice. You need to do it both places, so it's natural. Um, but being able to kind of turn off the fear mm-hmm. and just rely on your instincts and rely on your decisions, uh, even when, you know, you're in defense and they're down four touches, you know, keep yeah. that distance, rely on that uh, perfect pressure and have confidence to pull off that end of the strip parry. You need to be meditating and calm and to be able to call up that kind of calmness at the moment's notice when you're in, under intense pressure. You have to be practicing that every time at practice. Yeah, totally. And going to a practice that is not going to be just fun is also important. So you have to work hard in your bouts and also have an atmosphere where you're taking every bout super seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe tell the referee to call some touches against you on purpose to, to make sure that you stay calm. Like, okay, I dealt with this before. Deep breath. Let's get back to work. So one of my favorite things to do just to kind of mix it up a little bit we call these screw drills where just one person is just getting screwed in the middle and yeah. it's like every everything that's close when eliza and andrew fence each other is going to go to eliza it's gonna go to andrew or, or, or whatever yeah. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. you just have to like you just have to deal with it because sometimes whether it's through inexperience or whether it's through just like a little bit of bias because the referee prefers one style over the other. It it, it's going to happen to you at some point and you just need to be able to deal with it. And a lot of the time I see in practice, like, I don't know, we'll have, we'll have a touch that I thought was mine and the referee will give to you. And like the two of us will have a discussion about it. And we're just like, Oh, well, you know, let's just throw it out. Let's just not count it. Yeah. No. I think that's, yeah, that's like the worst thing you can do because it kind of, it, it, it almost like it takes away your mental feeling that you need to deal with stuff like that. Yeah. And it's good. If you aren't forced to deal with a kind of unfairness or pressure Mm -hmm. in a practice setting, you will not be ready to deal with it in a competition setting. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I've noticed in practice is a lot of time, good fencers will have a reputation of being good in the club or wherever. And then people end up calling touches in their favor just because, Hey, it's, it's so-and-so must be theirs. Yeah. And obviously that's super nice because it makes life easier. But then you realize you're being trained to almost be lazy on easy touches Yeah. and maybe even touches that are actually wrong. Yeah. So you have to be self accountable. Yes. That's a good point. No, no easy touches if you don't know honestly it's fine you know call it for that person call it for this person don't don't be nice yeah and you mean in practice i try to acknowledge a lot of stuff as, yeah. like acknowledge as... i know people say don't do it because you should be training yourself to be a good competitor but yeah. no it... hold yourself more accountable yes in it... you to be a better competitor in the long run right exactly in a tournament take everything like yeah. it doesn't matter how much yeah. It doesn't matter how much you know it's against you because that stuff is not going to be reversed at a tournament. But no. in practice, no. like my my favorite example of this is when like when one person is attacking in, in the middle. And these days, if you put your foot down like a little bit first and then hit there, as long as like the cut is still smooth, they'll still give it to the person who puts their foot down first. I hate that. But yes. Yeah. You may hate it, but that's what happens. So, like, sometimes the person on defense will just kind of stop, not really pull the attack short and just, like, counterattack and want the touch. And yeah. and if the person gives it to you, that's reinforcing a bad habit. Just, yes. like, just ma- I do that. make a full yep. action. And yep. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, fine, you got that touch, but that doesn't, that's not going to really help you. It. Yeah, it's not going to help you in the long run. Stuff no. like that. Just Just force yourself to do it. So pull them short all the way. Yeah. That's what the coach tells me all the time. Don't rely on the referee to call that, uh, that, that foot. Exactly. There's, n- yes, there's, there's going to be no question if they swing yeah. and miss you. <laughs> when I fenced Shao in the finals of the Montreal Grand Prix a couple months ago, I relied on that too much. I was pulling her, I was relying on her, you know, on the foot landing to be called attack no post. Mm-hmm. Um, and nope, it didn't work in my favor a couple times. 
yeah. that was 13, 14, uh, 13, 15. So and it it's, a it's a hard habit to get out of, but it's just like, like you said, in practice, if you, if you build good habits there, they'll come out in the tournament. Yep. So it's a good thing. Yep. It's, you have to hold yourself accountable. And it's so important to just hold yourself accountable and not get those lazy touches, make everything yep. super clear, not just to the referee, but like action wise into yourself too. Right. And don't just fence around uh, no touch, you know, no score. Because that way you're just being super relaxed. You're mm -hmm. not actually going to be fencing under pressure. Yeah, totally. You know, short amount of fencing, make the bouts really, really efficient, intense, and then sit down, take a break, and then go up and be super intense, and then sit down. Don't mm -hmm. just stay up forever doing no score. Yeah. That's my best uh, comment for practices. Yeah, I agree. Um what what do you feel is the biggest difference between when you are fencing well and when you're fencing poorly? Um, when I'm fencing poor, poorly, obviously there's a confidence issue usually underneath it, but most importantly, it's because I'm thinking too much. Okay. Obviously thinking is important, but you have to find a sweet spot. I, I found in my career where you have planned things out. You know that the fencer is weak with X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Planned out A, B, C to counter those mm -hmm. in your bout. But then you have to stop thinking about what they do. Because then you're just going to be overthinking it and reacting to what they're doing. Instead of planning what you're doing and trusting yourself to just get out there and fight. Yeah, one of, so one, every one, time I overthink it, I do badly. Interesting. One of the things that I think is so interesting about fencing is there's so many of these like so many of these aspects of fencing where it's like you you have two complete extremes and then it's trying to find a balance in the center for this specific person. So it's yep. like how reactive should I be versus how premeditated should I be? And yep. there's obviously one where it's just like I'm going to do double advanced lunge no matter what happens and the other is just like I'm going to come in slowly and react no matter what happens. And you want to like find a nice balance. Maybe it's more towards right. reacting. Maybe it's more towards like premeditating, but there's yep. so many little things like that in fencing. Yep. You have to figure out what works well for you. Yeah. For me, it's more leaning toward me just doing what I know is right and leading the bout as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, rather than watching and reacting. So yeah. there is some of that in the middle of an action, a long action, you have to be good at reacting. Right. None it's of that. It's a balance. So you'd say you're like more towards one side than, than the other in yeah. general. Yeah. Yes. I, I think okay. I'm, I'm in the same spot as you are. Like you, you just pick your thing mostly. And if you see something's about to go horribly wrong, you should be able to then fix it. Adjust. Yeah. But as much as yeah. But if you, if you are put in a situation where you just are reacting every time, then you leave yourself susceptible to someone finding like, like a, a sweet spot almost in your distance and just like, faking you either way and then it's like whatever you're doing is wrong if i just you're... think inherently if you're reacting too much you are always a tempo behind yeah so you're never really going to be in control so yes, you're going to exactly. be relying on them making mistakes rather than you doing good touches and the higher the level you get to the less natural mistakes, mistakes people are going to make. make yeah so exactly that that strategy may work at a low level but like that I think that kind of person will see themselves plateau at a certain point. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So you're working with Oleg Stetsev now, right? Yes. What made yes. you What made you go to him after you were done at Princeton? Well, it wasn't like a done at Princeton. Now I'm over at Oleg. So I graduated Princeton in 2013, and I stayed as a volunteer assistant coach, uh, so that I could continue to train with the team. Because oh, nice. I liked training there. Yeah. I liked working with Riso Christoff. Yep. Uh, and I liked the ability to go up to New York to bout there. Yeah, it's a good uh, spot. Anything. It was a great setup. Um, uh, and it was just after 2016, Riso Christoff retired. He wanted to go back to California to be with his family. Yeah. Um, I didn't make the Olympic team in, in 2016. Uh, so I basically had a crossroads. I had to see whether I wanted to continue. If I did, what coach I would use, would go to. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of good decisions I had to make. So I basically decided I wasn't going to let a failure kind of cap the, you know, be the end of my fencing career because I liked it too much. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could 
push through and do it. Um, and then I had to figure out what coach would, I would possibly go to. And there are several good coaches, obviously. Yeah. Um, I briefly talked to a few, but Oleg had over the past couple of years always kind of been very supportive. Uh, like if he was around, you would always strip coach me at competitions. Risto Risto was never able to come with me to international competition. So I was always on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when Oleg Setsev was around and he saw that, he would just step in and help me out. And we worked really well together yeah. with his strip coaching. So that was already set up. Like when I won my medals in Moscow and Senegal in 2014, he was strip coaching me. Oh, really? It was really good yeah. times. Two times in that season when he was strip coaching me, I won medals. Yeah. It was pretty clear that we had, you know, a good repartee. I like um, I like a lot about his coaching style that like it's it's not like his fencers are like stamped out of mach- out of a machine, like and all look completely yeah. identical. They're all so totally different. Yeah. Um, um he is more of a situational coach. He will obviously drill technique but he trains like how to set up an action. Yeah. 10 different ways to set up an action. It's much more cerebral or um, smart fencing than, I don't know, on average. Which kind of fits into the the style that we were talking about before. I've right, just, right, yeah. right. So it, worked, it, it, it seemed like it would be a very good fit. Yeah. I basically sat down with him, um, kind of like an interview style, like, <laughs> You know, are you willing to be my coach? What do you need from me? What do I need from you? What are the parameters, you know? Yeah. Like kind of like a pseudo contract here. What are you expecting? What am I expecting? And that's um, a good so, thing to do. You uh, go in with a good understanding from both of you what's what's yeah. going on. So Yeah. Um I was definitely a bit down <laughs> after not making the twenty sixteen team. Yeah. And he was like, You're gonna do XYZ. We're going to start training in this way. We're going to slowly ramp up. You're going to lose that depression weight, uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to we're going to go from there. And we have X Y Z plan. You're going to start getting these results here. We're not going to obviously expect you to get a 32 at a right off the bat. We're going to work up to it. Mm-hmm. An expectation. We're going to work these many times a week and do this kind of training. Um, it seemed great. I could trust him, and that was, at the end, the most important thing for me. Yeah. That I could trust my coach. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, and so we started working together. We meshed really well, and yeah. I'm glad I did. Yeah, so me it's too. Okay. It's hard to find someone who, who like, is, is such a, it sounds like such a perfect fit, like, mentally, tactically, yeah. personality-wise. Yeah, yeah. I got a little lucky. Yeah, totally. Hey, there's always luck in life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so speaking of luck, we've kind of had, we've been through just kind of like a weird time in the world right now. And yes. as we're having this conversation, the Olympics were postponed officially yesterday. Yeah. So how's, how's, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how to like phrase this question. It's just, it, it, it's destabilizing on the one hand, but it's also kind of nice on the other because there was so much uncertainty about what was going on. And now at least you have some closure, although you have to push yeah. your training back, like the, yeah. the, the progression of it a little bit. So how has that, how's that affected you? I mean, obviously it's not a good thing. Uh, it's a bit of a bummer. Yeah. Um, having to have the Olympics delayed um, because right now we were 98% done with our qualification. Yeah. Um, you know, approximately, um, Two turns and we were gearing up to, you know, what would we, what we would need to be doing for the rest of the season for zonals for Olympics. You know, there's a certain kind of training that goes into the second half of the season yeah. as opposed to the first half of the season. So we keep up the momentum mm-hmm. ideally. <clears throat> and now suddenly we're having to just stop everything on a dime. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a challenge to figure out exactly what kind of taper build up to do again um to stay focused and physically fit without injuring yourself because you don't want to stay at olympic quality fencing all year round yeah um so 
that said, it was obviously going to be necessary given, you know, the pandemic. Right, yeah. Uh, and it's the responsible thing to do. So feeling bad about it is pretty selfish, I understand. You're allowed uh, to feel so bad about it for a couple of days. It. You just got to deal with it and, you know. Yeah. There are some silver linings and we have to focus on those more. Yes, of course. Um, like I'm going to have more time to be super, super fit with conditioning. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to do as much conditioning because there's been so much fencing. You know, there are certain injuries that crop up when you do a lot of fencing. Right. Uh, so now I'm going to be able to back off on the fencing and really work on my fitness. Yeah. Silver lining. I'm going to be able to work on a, um, f fixing one or two overuse injuries. Silver lining. Yeah, totally. There are ways of handling it and being positive. You get and to hang out with your cat. Yeah, spend more time with my cats. Great silver lining. Yeah. <laughs> Where is he? He's right here. He's watching Hi, me. Hi, pumpkin, you little lump. <laughs> He's playing a floof loaf. <laughs> guarding me. <laughs> yeah. So, you no. Know, uh, and then in the meantime, I can study what I need to study because I'm trying to take the MCAT, do my med school applications. Oh, damn. Honestly, um... Last year, I had to delay MCAT, uh, my med school applications, and I was really bummed about it because that meant I wouldn't be able to matriculate this fall. Yes. In, in perfect timing, right after the Olympics finished. Well. Now, <laughs> hey. Yeah. A little more luck in life. Uh, things work out. So. Things always work out. Are you planning on being completely done with fencing after this Olympics, no matter what? Or. I don't like to um, kind of make that decision because then you think, oh, I'm right. I'm done in two months, you know, away from, you know, two months away from the, from the Olympics. Yeah, totally. You want to be at the height of your game and expect to be amazing forever. Yeah. And then figure life out afterwards. So right, right. That's, my, that's my plan. I'm going to wait till it happens and then I'll figure life out. Yeah. My dad always tells me like, there's a lot of social pressure on you, which is put on you by other people. And sometimes yeah. people feel like they yeah. need to move on and like start their life or whatever. But he, he always reminded me, he's like, he's like, you may feel like you want to get a job, but you like so many of your friends would kill to be in the situation that you're in right now and just appreciate that. And just like, don't put that mental pressure on yourself because you're only going to be this age and have this chance like once and once yep. it's done you know it's yep. done so i had the same uh process when i graduated from college everyone was like what are you doing with your life why yeah. haven't you started a career why are you being so irresponsible <laughs> a lot of people like when i stayed to be an assistant coach at um a volunteer assistant coach at princeton even the college kids were like hey why is it you're still here what a loser yeah. uh so yeah <laughs> Just because, you know, at Princeton especially, there's, like, you follow the plan. Yeah, the template. Graduate, you move on to, like, being a banker on Wall Street, <laughs> you know. Um, there's, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I knew that I wanted to do med school. But then again, I talked to my parents, uh, and I tried to think it out logically. I'm going to be a doctor for 40 years. I'm not going to have a window to go to the Olympics ever again. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to use it while I have it. Yeah, what's the rush? Uh, and, you know, do what I can. Yeah, totally. And, and I mean, social like... Social pressure dictate your life. If you look at the example that uh, Lee Kiefer has set, you you may still have some, t like, some opportunity while you're in med school, so... That too. See? Never say never. Yeah, exactly. I don't know who said that first, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Hmm... Ooh, I got one. Have you had any like epiphanies or revelations during your career that have um I don't know, that have that have really helped you a lot? Um <laughs> <laughs> My fencing, especially this quad, really turned around like at a specific tournament. I remember the moment. Um and it was when, I'm not going to name names, but things weren't, you know, being sunshine and daisies, essentially. I was being, 
put under a lot of pressure and a lot of doubt was being cast on me, you know, regarding my ability to fence. Um, and that kind of woke up this crazy fire. And I was like, I'm not going to listen to anybody else ever again, ever again, except for me and my coach. Mm. And then you stop paying attention to all the garbage going on around you. And then everything becomes much simpler. Nice. It's very important to do that when you're doing international fencing because there's just too much to handle if you don't put on the blinders, decide that you're going to fight, and go out there and do it. Yeah, that's that's great advice. <clears throat> and I think that's something that not just, not just like outside of a tournament, but like in a bout too. I think yep. a lot of, a lot of people take too much stuff with them into a bout when you should just be focusing on like the distance, the action. Um, there was one, there was one tournament I lost to uh, Alex Ochoke in the top eight and yep. it was fifteen thirteen. It was a very intense bout. And after the bout was over, I shook hands with him and I turned around and realized that because our bout was the last one that was going on, literally everyone was watching us. We yep. had a crowd of like, of like 300 people or something. And I remember thinking, when did all these people get here? And it was just like, I was just like so zoned in. I didn't even notice. That's how it has to be though. Yes, Otherwise exactly. you're like, oh, that person's watching me. Ugh, I don't yeah, like that person. They're hoping I lose. It's too much. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's too much you extra information. Yeah, none of that stuff is relevant to what's going on. Like, it's just you and me. So yep. that's that's the mentality yep. that you have to have. And just, like, the fewer factors, the better. So Keep I like that. Simple. Yeah, the, the blinders is, is good. Put on those blinders. And I always ask this question because everyone has, like, every, every person has such a different mentality and you never know what's going to click with, with people. So, like, maybe maybe a couple people will will hear that analogy and just be like, that makes perfect sense. And yeah. like, if it, if it helps a couple people, that's fantastic. So that said, when you have your blinders on, don't be like 100% speed all the time. It doesn't mean it has to be 100% intensity. Mm -hmm. it just has to be 100% focus. Yeah. And then relax your body, do whatever you can to, you know, shake off the tension and then go back into the action mm -hmm. and not paying attention to anybody around you. Yeah. 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 Qualify that. It's like world blinders. Mm-hmm. Blinders for every single aspect. You go out and you fence because that's what's important. Yeah, totally. All the drama can be forgotten. It can wait, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Anything else? Mm. Oh. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe... Um, all the NCAA kids who had their season cut short really early. Uh, don't let it get you down. Yeah. I, I witnessed, you know, I'm the varsity assistant coach again, <clears throat> volunteer assistant coach for the Princeton team, and literally seniors who were qualifying to NCAAs had their careers cut short. Yeah. It was really sad, and mm -hmm. I hope they don't let it get to them too much. Um, uh and we'll just uh, maybe maybe think about fencing after they've graduated. Maybe try out a couple World Cups. Fencing doesn't have to stop now. Right. Just because one good thing was taken away from you. So. Yeah, and not just that. Like I know a lot of people. A lot of people quit because they don't feel like they can ever be competitive again or something. <laughs> but you, um, you don't have to always just fence to be like the best in the world. You can fence to. Oh. To stay in Just shape, to, to see your friends. And then if, if like in a year or two, you, f you feel like you're in a good place, you can, you, like, you can start competing done. again. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But don't feel like you're forced to quit ever. Right. Yeah. You don't have to cut it off all your options happen. just because, I don't know, you're done with school or something. Right. You control your own life. Yeah, exactly. So just because one good thing was taken away doesn't mean there aren't plenty down the road. Yeah. Anyway. That was a sad moment when NCAAs were suddenly canceled. Yeah, true. I was I was hoping. I don't even know what I was hoping. I know they won't be delayed or anything, but mm. yeah. I was hoping it would just be, you know, back on in a couple of weeks. But now we're seeing that this whole thing is going to last a lot longer than we expected. So yeah, 
that's all the more reason for people to like be smart, practice social distancing and yep. not, I don't know. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't go outside and exercise, yeah. but be alone and stay, you know, six feet apart. Get some sunlight because it'll keep you mentally healthy. Yeah, exactly. Stick to a schedule. Try to yeah. like, try to find something to do and really lean into it. Like we were talking about before, um, before we got on this call, I've been doing like two or three videos a day at least and yeah. trying to use this as an opportunity to be like, Hey, all these people are available and like, I'm sure it's they're an opportunity. Don't miss them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so again, try to find the silver lining as much as you can. If you've been like, yeah. if you've been thinking about like wanting to learn the guitar or like trying to pick up yeah. Spanish or something, now is Learn a great French, time to do that. Whatever it is. Yeah. Go back to the kids series that you read. Like I'm going through Harry Potter series again, just because it's fun. Such a I great, love it. such a great series. So why not? Yeah. Lord of the Rings. Be a nerd. Own it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. Whatever you can think that you put off because you never have time, go enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Eliza. I hope we get to do yeah. something like maybe a ballot analysis or something soon. Yeah, absolutely. I know. We, uh, like hopefully. I said, we both have plenty of time, so. Yeah, right? Let's kill it. Let's do some projects. Fantastic. Yeah, I can say something pseudo smart. <laughs> I'm sure. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. Yeah. Yeah. Good job with all your uh, projects. Thank you. I appreciate that. Being the something world entertained. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Someone has to. Bye. Bye.